Good evening, everyone. My name is Mimi Cloche, and I'm artistic director of the Chicago International Film Festival. And I wanted to thank you all for joining us here tonight for our live streaming Q&A with the director of the very beautiful and moving film, And the Birds Rain Down. So I'd like to extend a very warm welcome and introduce you to the director, Louise Archambeau. Louise, thank you for joining us here tonight and for spending this time with us to talk about your film. Thank you for the invitation, you know. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Um, before we get started, I'd like to thank Canada Now and Telefilm Canada for sharing this film with us um, and with our audiences. I would also like to thank the Canadian Consulate in Chicago, and particularly a thank you to Colleen Duke for making this happen, and I'd like to wish everyone a happy belated Canada Day. <laughs> Um, I wanted to remind our audiences who are joining us that um, if you're watching us on our YouTube channel or on Facebook Live, you can add your questions to the chat box and they will be passed along and we would love to um, hear from you and incorporate them, in, incorporate them into the Q&A. So Louise, I'm just going to get started with some easy questions and then maybe we'll dig in a little bit. But um, first I was really curious about the script because I know you wrote the script but it's an adaptation of a novel. Um, and so um, one of the things that I loved is I think there's like two themes in the film, which um, one I think is more complicated than the other, but are very connected. And one is I feel like there's this question of kind of this life affirming story that's about kind of fierce independence. And what does it mean to make your own choices in life and in death and not let decisions be made for you or if they have been made for you to overcome that? And then, of course, at the heart, there's also the love story. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about this question, because it's about kind of making your life your own and things your own, how you went about the process of making the story your own for the film and what was involved in the adaptation process. It's a huge question. <laughs> well, first of all, you know, when I read the novel, I, I was moved by, by it uh, and by the characters and, and by the themes. Like you're saying, you know, it's about uh, love for sure. You know, what do we want in life? Or we do, what do we need? Mm -hmm. I guess it's love, being loved, and having our own dignity. Mm -hmm. And yes, in, in, this, uh, in this story, you know, the characters, they make choices at some point in their lives. And they want to make their own choices of, you know, of their own lives and the way they will live it. And uh, yeah, and I think for me, it's really interrelated with uh, dignity as well. You know, it's a, and it's, it's a story uh, of hope and, and uh, openness as well. So, you know, when I, I, I finished the novel, I was like, you know, continuing to work on other stuff and reading other novels and stuff. But after, after a few months, this story just stayed with me. And I was like, gosh, I have, you know, I, there's a film there. there there's something... Uh, um, bigger than me, than my life, that I, I want to, to uh, transmit to others, you know? And uh, I was like, oh my God, who's going to go see Hermit, you know, in the forest like that film? <laughs> so I did try, and in the, in the novel, it's all structured. Each chapter is, is a character, you know? Okay. And one, one chapter is like the forest and the fire forest, and one chapter is you know, about Marie de Neige and then Tom and then, you know, and so on. So I did uh, mingle all that, and, and I did have in conversations as well with the, the author, Justin Saucier, you know, what did you want to say? Because I really wanted to be, she was my first uh, audience, right. of course. So to be true with the essence of it, and what did it mean for me, you know, what did I want it to, to translate with that? And I, I think it's that, it's about, you know, hope and openness. And I think more than ever in our lives, in our lives, if we can have that, you know, I, I don't want to send a message, but just like to, you know, we, 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 we extend an, a hand and just like, I'm listening to you, you know, maybe I don't agree all the time, but, but maybe, you know, I want you to be happy with your life. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 
Were there things that were complicated that had to be um, left out either because of the restructuring? And I want to come back to the structure in a second, but or um, just because you had to condense the film into two hours or um, and then I guess were there things that you also thought you needed to bring in to kind of make the film? Because I think one of the things you succeed that a lot of, in which a lot of adaptations often don't is making it feel very cinematographic. So. Well, yeah, I, I, when I was read, writing it, it was quite strange. You know, it's the first time it had happened to me. I was uh, smelling, you know, it smelled the, the, the wood, the forest, the moss, you know. I was like, gosh, I, I really dove into that world. And, uh, yeah, so for sure, there's always, like, you cannot go as easily, if, especially if you don't have a voiceover in a film, you cannot go as easily in someone in the, into a character's mind. So it has to be, uh, it has to evoke. And um, and yes, the, 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 and what's helpful with uh, the film and images is like an image can tell a lot. Like in the novel, the, the forest is a character by itself. And so we did find that I think it's a great forest where, where we shot. It was really um, raw, you know, nothing, no electricity, no running water. Uh, my actors were, oh my God, amazing. <laughs> and, um, and, but there are some other things I did add because each of the characters, they have their path. And as for Tom, who's the singer, in the novel, I think once it said, you know, oh, he likes to, you know, sing a bit and, and play a bit of guitar, but only once in the novel. And I thought it was a great way uh, to uh, express all of his emotions and what he had inside himself with the, that's why I did choose those songs, you know, for what they were saying. And, and the way he sang it as well, you know, there was something that I, I hope it, it did translate. Yeah, I mean, I think as an audience of the film, that is absolutely how we connect with Tom is through how he expresses himself through the music. Um, so I mean, what that, when you, you're writing, it's like, oh yeah, yeah. And then try to find an actor, you know, we're in French part of Canada. I did work, I did find, search in Europe and there were, you have to find, you know, a 70 year years old actor, good, gifted, uh, plays the guitar because most of them they cannot play anymore uh, and sing and oh, I was like, oh God, that was difficult. I almost cut that part, but then Rémi Girard came in. I didn't see the actor at all like that, but he, he did send me two songs. We had, we we're in the same um, uh, agency, you know, talent agency. And I was like, oh, little, you know, he's a good singer, gosh. And then we met the day after and he said, you know, this is the part for me, you know, it's one of the best part of my life. Yeah. And uh, I was like, well, yeah. Um, and you're, you know, a gifted actor, but I, I saw my actor like older and it was like, I'm 69, I'm old. <laughs> I, thought, well, I, I thought, you know, the actor would be like, you know, the skinny alcoholic type. It was like, okay, maybe I won't be that skinny for the part, <laughs> you know, I'll try. But I know the character, I know. And then we talk for an hour and a half about life, our, you know, our family, our children, our, and struggles in life. And he had, you know, many things in, in his personal life. And, and then we got quite emotional. And then I said, Rimi, you know, all that, you're, you know, what you're feeling, that's what I want in the character, it's a part of you. You know, it's difficult to go there. I w and he said, I will do everything. And he was so generous. Yeah, I mean, I did want to talk about the casting because I think that all of them are um, amazing. But um, I mean, obviously Remy playing Tom and I think Andre, she's just perfect. And I was so sad to learn that she passed away last year. So I was wondering if you could talk generally about the casting process because there's a, a really wonderful chemistry amongst the characters, especially those living in the woods together. Um, and just both casting and then what kind of that chemistry or what that atmosphere on set was like, as you said, you were in the woods, you know, off the grid um, and what that was like working with them. They have such a great range of, 
um, talent and experience that they're bringing um, to the film, to the roles. Yeah, it was quite uh, particular. Well, when I, when I was writing, I, I had André La, La Chapelle in mind. And, you know, each, you know, I was each six months, she would say, you know, I don't know if I'll be there in six months. You know, it was like, and she didn't want to play anymore because, you know, she got older and, and uh, she lost her partner who was a filmmaker, very gifted uh, filmmaker uh, of cancer. And she was like the caregiver. How do you say that? You know, and yeah. she was exhausted and a bit depressed. And, and then when I did offer her the part, it was one of her favorite novels in the last years, you know, a few years. And she would um, give uh, as present to her friends that novel. And she was like, I have to do that part. I need to do, you know, this part. And, and you know, she got back, you know, and we got her in shape. And But it was quite special, you know, at 87 years old to be there and, you know, to do... Um, you know, in the four wheelers, like in the forest and fishing, hunting and stuff. She was amazing. And we would sleep in the forest. It was so uncomfortable, you know, where we had like a, a small dorms. It was like a mixture be between a uh, prison and monastery. Pee-pee in the like yogurt, you know, pot, you know, next to our beds. So she was such a trooper. Wow. And, uh, and uh, at, you know, in the middle of the shoot, and we had only 26 days, we, so it was quite uh, intense. Right. And she said, and she, she, she really was one of the most amazing women or human I, I met in my life, you know, so generous. And, and um, just in French, we say bienveillant, you know, take care of others, whatever the, the other person, you know, there's no rank in, or anything. And um, at some point she told the, like the crew, um, this shoot makes me live again. And so that made it, you know? And then she passed away last fall. Actually what's quite uh, moving is she did ask for, uh, she, she got sick and she got cancer and she was tired and she was 88 years old and she asked and, and didn't know, she didn't tell me um she asked for help to to go away you know how do you say that in english yeah euthanasia just for um to be euthanized for you yeah. well there's <laughs> in french we have a in french it's quite elegant it's like aid uh help to pass away you know okay. to move on. Yeah. her her family told me that you know she had a smile and and she was with she was with her wool socks the last day and with whole her whole family and little children and just you know saying you know singing and just being there and loving and you know it's difficult because it's someone i really would like to have uh, some more conversations but i know sh she she made her choice right. like in the film so it's quite moving and as for uh, Gilbert Sicot, who plays Charlie, he's younger than the part, but I saw him on other things, other films, and she, he's an amazing actor. And, and they, he, they know uh, themselves well, you know, André and Hubert. And André, you know, she realized it was difficult on set to remember lines and stuff, and never in her life she had difficulty to remember lines, so it was quite scary. So I was like, you know, André, we'll go day by day, you know, and we'll find tricks. But Jibai right. was so generous because he's, you know, just put his ego uh, outside there, you know, and just be, he, he was there for her. So it, it did create in that forest, just like a bonding, you know, and yes, we're making a film, but that's not the important thing. It was what we, we what, we were experiencing at that moment. And André, it was, it's quite amazing. It was, you know, she made many films and, uh, you know, she had a big career. It was the first time she would, she did make love on screen. So that was something. <laughs> well, it's interesting, kind of that care that you're saying that, um, that he demonstrated toward her and that chemistry that they developed on set as, 
actors, as humans, you just absolutely see that coming through in the film, so in the characters. So mm -hmm. I have a question since we're talking about cast that's coming from an audience member and said how much it's from Chad Rubel, how much he really enjoyed the film and what a big fan he is of Flamey and thinks he's a great choice for Tom. But he also says he loves the connections that the characters have with the dogs. And was there anything special that you did in terms of working with the dogs? Because they do play such an important in the, yeah. the life of you those. When you're writing, you're like, okay, each of them, they have dogs. So they have, there's four dogs. And when you're shooting and you have 26 days, we're like, what did I think of? Four <laughs> dogs. But they were amazing. At some point, like one of the dogs, who's a boy chuck dog he, you know he passes away at the beginning of the film but we have that scene it's a very small scene and you have that character charlie who's going into um a boy chuck's cabin yeah. and he passed away and so charlie's quite moved by that and and then you have the dog jack just coming in and he goes just like under it you know just through like the elbow yeah. the arm and just smelling his master and then looking at at Charlie as if he knew, you know? And I was like, I would have tried to do that. It wouldn't ne have never worked. But sometimes you just have to, and I, ha I have a great DP, director of photography, who lets go, you know, like in the documentary, just see what happens. Yeah. And as for the other dog, um, Chummy, who's uh, at some point he jumps in the water. There's, you have like Marie de Neige, and then at some point he goes into the water. It wasn't supposed to, but I kept it in the film because it was like just natural. And it made my actress being more natural that way. Right. And of course, when he do, does that, we have to dry the dog and stuff so we don't shoot. <laughs> but there, and that's always, with, you know, you have a wrangler. So an animal wrangler and that woman, she's uh, she's the master here in Quebec. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, they created some really like touching and beautiful moments. Um, and you, you really understood kind of how important that human connection with the dogs was. Um, so and I want mom, and I just want to add my mom, my first job was to work in a pet shop. Oh. <laughs> my, mom, my mom had a pet shop. So we had a many, many animals at home and I couldn't bear to have the baby, you know, the, the puppies in the cages. So I had, when I, I was 15 years old, I had to take all the puppies, go to the park with them and then bring them back because I couldn't stand to have them there. So. Great. Well, I wanted to come back to this question about the structure of the film. Cause one of the things that struck me kind of both watching it and then reflecting on it was, um, it seems that the film is structured around a couple of different absences. Um, so the first one would be, you know, the character of um, Ted Boychuk, who we of course see at the beginning, and even though he's gone very quickly in the first act, um, he has a presence throughout the film, or his absence is presence um, in the way that he lives on, both in the character of Raf searching for him and discovering his paintings. Um, and then I think the second absence, um, which again is always a presence, but we see it in such interesting, or it enters the film in such interesting ways, is the question of the, the wildfires and the forest fires. And, um, you know, they're kind of always there somehow, um, you know, I think in a both ob obviously in a metaphorical way as well. But again, like Raf, she's there because she's searching or researching the history. We see them in Ted's paintings. They talk about them encroaching on them. And then you'd make that really interesting choice with the interstitial scenes of the wildfires raging. Um, and then the last kind of absence that I notice is this emptiness that the characters are always talking about that either they feel inside and they're trying to fill or they used to feel it and they've been able to fill. So was that something that you were consciously kind of aiming for or, um, you know, how did you think about, um, I guess, absence and presence in the film? It's, it's very interesting. I never, I never thought of it that way, but totally it's there. Um, I, and no, <laughs> for sure when you're making a film or, and you have like 
not that much money. You have to be creative. Sometimes, sometimes it's not uh, present on screen. But then again, I, I did feel, uh, for sure for all the characters, there's something that they feel differently. You know, it, they, they, they have absent, all of them, they have a kind of absence. Mm -hmm. And and they some of them did fulfill it or you know they make choices with that and or accept it you know it's resilient but then again I did um, see it more in a, um, a like opposite structure like as if Bo like Boychuk his story you know it makes the film it needs to be there because he's the link for the whole film and the whole you know every characters every character character but his story is like. He didn't. He he had a tragedy in his life. He lost his whole family when he was 15. He saw them dead because of a fire forest. So it's like like ignited, uh, in, uh, starting in come on, so, uh, element. You know, right. the first thing. But then again, uh, and then there's love. You know, his path is go. He goes at some point. He decided. He did. You know, he had. Uh, to make a choice with love, he couldn't make it. Maybe because he couldn't love anymore. He didn't know how. So he did make a choice to uh, go and live remote, you know? Right. But he got hunted in, and he always did paint his past. And then the opposite path is Marie de Neige, Gertrude. Uh, um, she got removed from the society and her own choices at 16 years old, and then at 80, past 80 years old, uh, she discovers life and maybe love as well. So it's opposite path and choices as well, because maybe some people, when they get older and they 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 did experience, let's say let's, let's say like Marie Neige, you can stay in, um, uh, how do you say that, rancœur? You know, you can be uh, bitter with life. And, but then again, and she said, it just happened, but she she opened, she did open it up to possibilities there yeah. in the forest, you know? And I, I think once you open up to what's happening, there's many things that can happen but you have to open your heart and the possibilities as well. Yeah. So that's what I saw. And then as for the fire forest, you have the present moment and the past. For sure, the fire forest, uh, there's something about, I think, humility uh, mm -hmm. of us humans in, in, in this on this planet. There's something about, we forget to be humble about what we have. And it, you know, it's, it's such a, a treasure. And we have to cherish it. <coughs> and and there's uh, as well, it, it's a um, <clears throat> metaphor for a love as well. Right. You know? So, you know, since I think the setting, as you've talked about already, is so key to this, this film, um, both kind of in its um, remoteness, but also proximity to the pending, uh, or the forest fires, which are, feel like they're encroaching on them. And of course, it's this incredibly like gorgeous, sumptuous location that's just filled with life. So I was wondering if you could talk, you know, about location shouting and choosing to shoot off the grid, which is of course, like you said, you were on a low budget and you had a very limited time frame, and what the challenges were with that, but also, you know, working with an incredibly talented cinematographer who's able to, I think, you know, really capture the essence of the place and its role in the story. Yeah, well, uh, I think uh, for every film, and especially that one, uh, to find the right location, uh, it, it's the essence of it. You know, it's the basic thing because it helps uh, It helps the cinematography, it helps the actors, it helps me for a mise en scene. Right. Uh, it, it totally helps uh, the set decorators as well uh, because um, most part of it is done. Right. And then you can just put a camera and actors, and even though we don't have cabins, well, just shoot, you know. Yeah. So, so that that helps, and then to be to play with the elements as well, because when you have twenty six day, days, you don't choose. Oh, okay, I'm gonna take a half day off. Well, no, you know, <laughs> you have to be creative. And okay, maybe we cannot shoot that scene, but we can do something else. 
are, you know, the, uh, the actors are swimming in the lake and it starts to rain, but maybe you capture that moment and you, you, you film the rain just dripping on the water and maybe it, go, it's, it's, it gives poetry to an image. So just to, yeah, to be aware of, you know, sometimes you're driving and then there's a curve. Well, just instead of, no, when I want to go to the curve, well, just, you know, enjoy the curve. <laughs> with the dog, you know, so yeah. it's part of it as well. Yeah. Great. We have another question from the audience, and this is about the intimate scenes between Marina um, Dinej and Charlie. So um, these types of scenes are rarely seen between older actors on screen. And the way that you shot it was very tender and dignified and romantic. So what was your decision making process when determining how you wanted to shoot this scene and working with the actors to shoot it? Mm -hmm. uh, well, in the novel, uh, it, it was a very, an, an, well, the key scene actually for those two characters. So I knew I had to shoot it and the actors as well. Yeah. So, um, and that actually the main, I do a parte, the uh, author, Justine Saucier did agree that I, I adapt that novel, her novel, because I did a film, a previous film before, uh, called Gabrielle. Yes, and I love the film. Yeah. yeah, and she's it's with a mentally challenged woman, a twenty year old woman, and and there's a intimate scene as well. And she said, "Well, you did that in the film; it was beautiful. So you can, you know, carte blanche, you can do whatever you want." But then again, <laughs> so I did, you know, for this film, since I knew I didn't have that much time to shoot. I really did uh, some lecture, you know, readings and, you know, um, um, read the script with the actors and the crew and then, you know, trying to do um, some just rehearsing, you know, and trying to find like the, the, the same vocabulary for everyone. And, uh, and then at some point I did ask, you know, support, uh, some member of the, of the crew to, to bring a mattress uh, in rehearsal, so and it did put Andre La Chapelle and Gilbert Sicot on the mattress. It was a camping mattress, but easy to go in, but to go out of there that was difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we did laugh and we did find the angle how you know they would feel good, and I would I, I would feel that you know they they look good, and I used to say to the both of the actors. I want to make you in 2020 the, the sex symbols, you know, in Quebec. So they did laugh a lot, but arrived the day. So we're in the forest, you know, and I, it's a bit cold that morning. I have like, uh, you know, a, a winter coat. <laughs> and, so, and we always, the, the whole uh, shooting, we had a, a medical uh, guy with us, you know, for Andre because of her age. And uh, he, he comes to me and says, well, you cannot shoot this this morning. You know, her pressure, she's like, I have high blood pressure and so she's very nervous. So I was like, okay, well, we'll find something else. And, and we shoot something else. And at some point, Andre La Chapelle comes to me and she says, I want to do this. Okay, I'm ready. Okay. So we go in the, in the cabin. It's, it's close set. So, you know, very small crew. Right. And we, they, the actors, they have like, underpants but it's like beige underpants really thin thin you know right. for my it's called a tea bag apparently it's not very comfortable <laughs> and at some point andre la chapelle she was like do we really need we need that or not and they did, did remove everything yeah. and before they did uh play in another yeah. film 15 years ago or 16 years ago uh, he was playing his son, and she was um, she had dementia, and at some point he did uh, carry her like naked. So they, you know, they had that story like many years before. So, but then again, both of them they were so nervous and uh, showing me or their scars and stuff, and I was like, I'm gonna, you know, I want you to be beautiful. And they said, okay, let's go. And they did put their ego outside and they just got to be the characters. Mm -hmm. But then again, you know, you're in a, on a film set. So the mattress is not sad, so good. It's cold in the cabin. And Audrey, she had a hip problem, so she couldn't move really. 
So, you know, to have the, to find the right angle, I would say, okay, Gilbert, I need André to be a bit left. And André was like, okay, Gilbert, just go. And then she would take her. And so we did laugh a lot. And usually when I shoot those intimate scenes, I talk all the time, like in uh, auction, you know, you're like selling stuff. So yeah. I'm like, okay, Gilbert, Gilbert, uh, put your left arm. No, no, the other left, the other left. Okay, well, smooth, smooth, smooth. Okay, ca- okay, nice caress. Okay, André, kiss. So Gilbert, kiss us more slowly. Or better kiss, better kiss. Okay. And then, okay, remove the sheet. Oh, slower, slower. Okay, go. And then, so the DP knows where to go and the focus puller as well. Right. And it's like a ballet. And at some point, at the beginning, they laugh, but then again, they they love it because they know I'm gonna uh, focus on the best part of it, and right. so they just have to listen and look at one another and just be. And they they're they're not afraid of technical. Am I okay? Or Andre, her breast is it? You know, for, I'm gonna I'm gonna take care of you and protect that. So that's what how we did it. Yeah, so there's an enormous amount of trust, not just between the two of them, but also with you as well, that make yeah. made it yeah, possible. Well, it, yeah. It must be so difficult. Imagine, you know, you have some films, but usually I do casting and I make sure that people, you know, the actors, they love each other. But there are some films you shoot and they do intimacy scenes or, you know, they play friends and they hate each other. Oh my right. God, that was difficult. <laughs> Great. Well, I was wondering if, I, I mean, I don't want this to be the last question, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about the ending of the film because I love that kind of very close juxtaposition of, um, it's bittersweet, you know, that juxtaposition of Tom's death with then them, you see them and, you know, you cut directly to them being in the house that's closer to the road, but clearly still in the country. And, you know, again, they're making, you know, those three characters have made choices that they're comfortable with um, that feel right in their lives. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't, again, I haven't read the novel, but just I was curious about that choice of um, putting those so close together and editing editing those scenes. Uh, I don't remember in the novel how it's done. It's made because since uh, each character, they have like, each chapter is a character. Um, but then again, it, I, I think it, it threads similarly in the novel. Um, I had other, other scenes. You can imagine I did cut like maybe three quarters of an hour of the film. Mostly with Raphael and Steve, we had more things with them. And, you know, at some point, uh, Steve, his mother would go to the uh, police station okay. to bail him out. So it was no no uh, dialogues, but then again, you know, yeah, I, I had a few scenes, but it was never ending, and I was like, two hours is enough, you know. I want to keep my audience there, and that's why that's how it it did. Um, that's why it's that close, maybe uh, Tom's death. But then again, since it was his choice, I didn't want for sure. It's sad, you know. It's moving. Right. Uh, and so it's moving for the other characters and for me making it as well. Uh, but since the, one of the theme of the film is to, uh, to choose your own life and your own death, it, it's, it's part of it. And it's the acceptance of your friend's uh, choice. Right. And I don't, I don't say it's easy, but maybe they, they, they had that pact, that deal. And, you have to accept that. Yeah, great. Um, well, you know, I think I'm going to go back to like the question that was asked about um, the the sex scene, the love scene. But you know, rarely do we see films where that take up you know septuagenarians or octogenarians as their main subjects. Um, but you do it in such a thoughtful and also I think thought provoking way that it compels us as an audience to also think about kind of what our own life choices are. And maybe, especially now it's resonating in this time of the pandemic where, you know, I think our lives are, are we're seeing them or they're reflected in a different way and thinking about how we make life choices. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the response um, in Canada or in Quebec to the film um, 
and what audience has have been giving back to you and once they see it? Well, uh, before answering to you, I just, you know, while I was writing the film, I didn't, uh, well, for sure I knew my act, my characters were like 80-ish years old, you know, 70s, 80 years, but what I was writing, I, I, I never thought, oh, it's about uh, the old age or it was like those characters that they had that path, you know, their, those lives and, and they were there in their lives. And so when the, the first journalists, some of them would ask me, you know, at the release of the film, oh, you know, it's about, you know, the old age. I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, I didn't think about that. You know, it was like a path. And love and hope, you know, and uh, and um, as to answer as for you know in Quebec, yeah, the film was a huge success, mm. uh, and it, it got a huge box office. And, and I didn't think that while I was like submitting, and you know, and especially last year, I didn't make two films, um, and the other one is like comedy for Christmas, and like. The investors, like a woman from Telefilm Canada, she was like, at some point, you know, before, you know, financing the films, she was like, why do you want to do And the Birds Ring Down, you know, with old characters and the forest, you know, just do the comedy and you know, invest in that. I was like, no, it's not, I want to do both and they're, they're different. But this one, they, it has, I need to say that I want to share those characters with the audience. Yeah. But, uh, and then the response was so strong that maybe it was like uh, it, it, it need, uh, we needed that, you know, and a lot of people, the audience, uh, a lot of people told us, uh, I saw it once, twice, or when I go to present the film or with the actors, wherever in the world, so many um people that they come to me and they just say they hug me and well now, now they cannot hug me anymore but uh, they hug me and they say thank you uh, thank they, you get, gave me hope uh um just to that yeah, to just give hope and whatever the age i think you know so yeah that's a it's, it's a good thing <laughs> Yeah, and the next question actually relates to this. And it's someone who first saw the film um, at TIFF, and she said, or I don't know if it's this year, he, they said that, um, you know, when they saw it with that audience, it brought so many people to tears. And like you're saying, it just resonated with audiences of all ages and backgrounds. And um, for, for you, and I'm, you know, of course, I think we can all speak to like our own experience of what resonates, but have you gotten other feedback about what you think makes the film so powerful or resonate with so many different audiences? I think you kind of just answered it saying like, it's a film that's ultimately, um, hopeful and, and, and filled with this idea that we can, you know, be masters of our own destiny or make choices that are, you know, suited to us. But is there anything else that you'd like to add about that? Uh, I think, yeah, well, well to uh, go back to the essence of life, I think uh, the forest, it makes just the, the forest it by itself, it makes that. And uh, not playing games. You are what you are. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, you know, uh, me too, you know, I have bad days, I have bad months. And what do you do then to, to go back and to, and sometimes it's just, instead of looking like that, you just like, and someone's looking at you and smiles. And it's like, okay, that's yeah. happening now. What do you do with that? Do, right. do you run away or just like, I know I come to chat with that person and it's gonna, gonna propose me to go elsewhere. There's that. And then to accept uh, the differences you know, because those uh, characters, they, they're they quite outcast, I think. Mm -hmm. And and it's okay to be. And sometimes you you you, you don't look outcast. Or you live in the city, and but you feel outcast. How come, you know? And it's not only a bad thing, maybe. You know, it's just the way it is. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So I think there's many layers. And I think, like I was saying before, the first thing, I, th I think it's about love, being loved, and having your own dignity. Right. And yeah. Great. And we did get one more question here about the location. And particularly, how did you find it? <laughs> I have the best location manager. That's why, you know, she's a photographer. She does uh, 
my, all, all my films. And, and then she was stubborn. She really wanted to go in that forest, far away. It was like, really? And then, and then uh, because it was difficult to find many places, we couldn't uh, uh, cut down the trees or make the cabins or, you know, or it was summer and, you know, people wanted to have their vacations and stuff. Or you had like planes and everything. So we found that place, but to match that, to find like um, the, be the best uh, little hotel, we didn't find any in that region, you know? So we did find it like four hours ago for, from there. So we shot a week there and we shot maybe three and a half weeks in, in the forest. And then for the, the, the bar scenes and the, um, what we, the, uh, the other house of uh, Geneviève and stuff, Right. We shoot in Petford Mines. So that's another part, you know, it's far, but my uh, location manager saw in her mind the puzzle that would make a hole. So I did, you know, travel by car and saw, saw all those locations. And when we uh, first saw the main location with the forest, it was in mid-April but it was tons of snow, maybe six foot of snow. So we went by a snowmobile and okay. then snow shoes with the DP. And then the, the guy was taking, taking us to the forest. We were in the middle of the lake, you know, which shows no shoes. And he <laughs> said, well, I think it's a good lake for your, you know, for your film. I was like, okay. I was like, okay, will the water be warm? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, and then we would walk in the forest and maybe a cabin here, yeah. And then we could go only like end of June because at some point you cannot go, it's like too muddy and everything just like goes into the... So, and then we, we discovered we had like, you know, the, the sucker uh, in the lake. Um, in leeches? leeches? Leeches, oh my God. So we were like, we couldn't do put anything in the, the lake. Uh, because sometimes you can put the uh, blocks of salt, they go there, but we couldn't do that, protect okay. the environment. So we were like, do we take, tell the actors or no? <laughs> no. <laughs> but they knew, and then they were super trooper, and we, you know, this is life. <laughs> you all suffered for uh, beautiful art. <laughs> <laughs> but the real thing, and we had like little porcupines at night, they would eat our sets. <laughs> but not the, the set, but they would give texture. <laughs> That's great. Well, after Gabrielle, I was so looking forward to your next film, and you did not disappoint at all. So I was hoping, um, I know you said you did this comedy that also came out last year, but what can we expect next, next from you? Uh, I'm writing. Uh, so we'll see. I guess it's still something um, uh, with um, openness at some point. And when you see uh, someone or a character in one way, but then more you go and more you discover something else. And yeah. Great. Well, we are definitely looking forward to it. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for sharing this film with us and uh, for being so generous and talking about it. And um, we will definitely uh, help uh, get the film out there um, in the community. So uh, I hope so. And uh, I hope to meet you in person the next time. Me too. Yeah. too. We uh, look forward to get, welcome you to, you to Chicago sometime. I would love that. Great. Thank you so much, Louise. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye.